A city under siege, gangs at war, police virtually powerless to stop them. So why isn't more being done to help the people of Haiti? We go inside one of the world's most violent cities, revealing a state of chaos. We've just seen uh, police patrolling, but it is constant gun battles here. And we continue to fight tooth and nail, night and day, to protect the area. Many of these families have moved multiple times, and they're all here because of the gang violence. The gangs say they represent these people. They say they do not. We need someone to help us out here. Haiti's collapse into anarchy and gang violence has come at a terrible human cost. In this special program, we'll examine what's happening and why. We'll speak to the gang leader known as Barbecue. He's warned more violence is imminent, but in a significant move, for the first time, he told us he'd consider a ceasefire. <laughs> The violence has left families starving. We meet those displaced over and over by a vortex of violence and poverty. We join the vigilantes battling to defend their neighborhoods tooth and nail against gang attacks. And amid daily gun battles and barricades, we see how authorities are trying to take back control of the capital. But we start with that exclusive interview with the head of one of Haiti's most powerful gangs, Jimmy Cherizier, who is known on the streets as Barbecue, has spoken to Sky News from behind the barricades where authorities can't reach. The same authorities he once worked for as a police officer before he flipped to the other side. Surrounded by heavily armed gunmen, he issued a chilling warning that the violence is going to get worse before there is any chance of peace. But for the first time, he told us he is willing to consider a ceasefire if his gang is allowed to join talks about the future of the country. Haiti has been paralyzed by weeks of violence that has seen whole districts burnt to the ground, tens of thousands of people displaced from their homes, while murder, rape and gun battles are a daily occurrence. The gangs are to blame for much of that. But Barbecue is a Robin Hood type figure in Haiti who provides food to the poorest in a country where many are starving. And that is in part why he's emerged as the face of the resistance. Interviews with him are rare and take weeks of negotiation. To meet him, our team had to go down a warren of back streets with snipers watching their every move to a meeting point where a group of armed gunmen in balaclavas were waiting. The Caribbean island of Haiti is the poorest in Latin America, with the capital, Port-au-Prince, having collapsed into anarchy and violence. There is no functioning government, with gangs controlling at least 80% of the capital city. The different coloured dots on this map represent the many competing factions. Barbecue is the leader of a gang alliance called the G9 Family and Allies, represented by those green dots. From deep inside his territory, he's spoken to our chief correspondent, Stuart Ramsey. He's not responsible for all the violence sweeping across Haiti's capital, but be under no doubt he's at the centre of it. His fighters are never far away. Is this now all your territory? Because it, it was an open road when I was last here. Yeah. Jimmy Cherizia, universally referred to here as Barbecue, is the head of one of the most powerful gangs in Port-au-Prince but he's also the head of a gang consortium that's brought Haiti to its knees. He took us through the roadblocks of buses they've put in place to stop police raids on his territory. That territory now extends over one of the city's main roads, an economic highway he controls in its entirety. <laughs> All the way to the bridge? Yeah. sees himself as a revolutionary for the people, and he rails against corrupt politicians and oligarchs. 
He dismisses all the efforts underway here to form a transitional council that will govern Haiti. But for the first time, he's told Sky News he would consider a ceasefire and talks if his people are represented. This is significant. We dialogue. We dialogue. dialogue. We dialogue. 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 Mais son façon pour renouveler le système, nan, jan li a. parce que le système est venu en bout. Li. Et quand il y a un monde riche et un pauvre en Haïti, en trop. dans le monde entier, il y a un monde riche et un pauvre. Mais les gens qui ont fait en Haïti, les gens qui ont fait en Haïti, en décembre, en nous prêt, toute solution, depuis ces Haïtiens qui sont sous table, nous même nous prêt pour nous chiter par là avec tout le monde. Parce que ça qui passe dans le pays, nous ne sommes pas fiers. Je suppose que pour que les armes devraient aller en place, Et les amis ont bien pu baisser, les pour baisser. Dans le moment où nous pouvons arriver dans la phase pour nous baisser, les amis, parce que les gens qui sont là pour nous faire la raison. Nous avons plus passé deux à trois ans depuis que nous avons eu un dialogue, depuis que nous avons demandé pour tout le monde qui sur table pour nous dialoguer avec les gens qui ont des amis. Personne ne veut nous faire la Et je veux dire, nous avons une situation qui nous n'avons pas avancé. Nous avons un objectif, un objectif non clair. While this is a major development, he worryingly predicts that the fighting is far from over. Um, yo pa choisi met tout moun sou tabla tout autant viv ansanm pa sou tabla pou nou vini pou nou chita pou nou pale tout autant nou pa gen reprezantan nou parce que jodi a conseil présidentiel conseil présidentiel sèt mwen sa nou pa gen reprezantan nou nou pa gen reprezantan nou c'est même système nan ki pral régénérer encore pou yo continuer tout pizi moun ki nan quartier populaire yo jodi a fòk nou reprezanter et lè nou reprezanter n ap la konnyan pou nou defann droit nou et que konnyan nou kapab di OK n ap chita Et nous faisons partie de la solution, qu'on a ensemble continué à faire solution pour payer la paix. Mais tout autant nous passons sous table, payer ça ne peut jamais payer. Inside his territory, despite the poverty, life is relatively peaceful and organized. Unlike in much of Port-au-Prince, queues for food, barbecue gets brought in, are orderly. Usually it's chaos. But here people wait, knowing that there are enough supplies for the whole community. This is a source of barbecue strength. To the outside world, he may be a gangster, but here he's a sort of Robin Hood. Well, we're right in the heart of barbecue's gangland territory, and I have to say the atmosphere here is very different to large parts of the rest of Port-au-Prince. It's much more chilled, much more relaxed. There's aid distribution, it's not chaotic. What the sense you get from this is that people feel safe inside here. The battlefield is outside the barricades, which is over there. Here, this is much more like a normal town. If you like. Watched on by his well-armed and battle-hardened soldiers, Barbecue says that plans for an international force led by Kenya to impose peace in Port-au-Prince will lead to more violence, whoever is in charge of it. The last time we met, you said if foreign, a foreign intervention was to happen here, poor people would die in the fighting. There is talk of it being Kenyans coming. Could you do business with them? Si Kenya yo vini, premièrement, yo pral vini faire massacre dans quartier populaire parce que oligarque yo avec politicien yo pral orienter yo vers quartier populaire sous prétexte que y a vinn déci tirer bandi, sous prétexte que y a vinn déci tirer gang, yo pral entrer dans quartier populaire yo et que pour yo vinn faire massacre. À ce moment-là, nous même qui gen zam nan men nou pa ka kite ça. Mais je dis à vous, bagay qui ont été cassés, évolués. Je dis à vous, depuis les militaires kenyans qui sont entrés, ou bien les policiers kenyans qui sont entrés, ou bien les policiers kenyans qui sont entrés, nous avons considéré comme des agresseurs. Nous avons considéré comme des envahisseurs. Et je dis à vous, nous ne pouvons pas collaborer avec aucun envahisseur, aucun agresseur qui vient sortir pour passer l'indépendance pays. Nous avons collaborer avec aucun envahisseur, aucun agresseur qui vient sortir pour passer l'indépendance pays. Nous avons goûté à continuer de toute façon. La route de barbecue maintenant contrôle est tout but déserté. 
the signs of battle, the burnt out cars and the deserted buildings, are the visual signs of uprooted families who've been forced to flee in their tens of thousands. He says he's trying to rein in the more violent gangs. He says they need to change their ways or risk losing their revolution. We have some sort of leadership collectively. And I don't want to use the force contre monsieur. Si mal utiliser la force contre son gourmet perpétuel la pied. Nous pas jamais qu'à faire ça nous besoin faire contre monde qui met des situations ça. Mais chaque jour, chaque jour, parfois nous parler 7 8 fois dans téléphone pour à chaque fois que me tendez dans nouvelle, soit au kidnap pour monde, soit gon bagaille qui pas bon, qui fait, nous toujours les messieurs dans téléphone pour nous garder ensemble comment nous capable corriger ça. Et même yo même tout qui t'a fait là, je dis à yo commencer prendre conscience que et ça pas bon, nous pas faire encore. Jimmy Terizier, a former policeman and self-proclaimed man of the people, he paused to fly a kite, an Easter tradition here, laughing and joking with his people. A criminal to many, but an unlikely hero in his territory, no ordinary society needs people like barbecue. But Haiti isn't normal. How or when it can achieve normality is impossible to predict. And Stuart joins me now from the Haitian capital, Port-au-Prince. Um, Stuart, extraordinary interview there, great um, scoop. Um, and I incredibly significant what he was saying. Yeah, I think it is. It, it's been said um, before here, but not really to the international press, the fact that he would consider a ceasefire if they're involved in sort of the political future of the country. Now, that's very difficult for the international community to consider, but it's interesting that he's saying the voices of his people uh, need to be heard, and if that was the case, then perhaps a ceasefire is possible. Of course, he did then go on to say that um, the violence was very likely to spike. It's been quiet for the last day or so uh, here, but he's saying it is basically going to start again and will perhaps be even more violent than it has been in the last few weeks. I tell you what was very interesting, though, that I've met him before, and he's not wanted us to film his, his gunmen, who are always with him. But this time, he was almost determined that they were in the pictures, and he, he gathered a lot of them uh, to be with us. And I think that is quite simply sending a message to anyone who's watching these reports that he is definitely on a war footing, uh, that he has a lot of support, a lot of well-armed men. And that's really the message that he's putting out, that if you don't listen to us, if we don't get involved uh, in any political future here, then you can expect more trouble. Stuart, uh, thank you so much for now. And we'll speak to Stuart again a bit later in the programme. But let's move on to those living in the shadow of the gang warfare. For innocent families, everyday life is becoming increasingly dangerous. Since the end of February, more than 2,500 have been killed, kidnapped or injured, with 33,000 fleeing the capital. The UN says 1.4 million Haitians are now one step away from famine. And more than 3 million children need emergency assistance. Stuart has been speaking to those displaced and in danger. It's hard to believe, but this is downtown Port-au-Prince, the heart of Haiti's capital. It should be full of people. It isn't now. Fighting is often intense here. Burnt out cars and buildings abandoned. The signature of the violence in this city. Market kiosks are empty. There's nothing to sell and nobody to sell it to. Rows of shops are shuttered and closed down. An armoured police vehicle guards the road to the presidential palace, waiting for the gangs to attack again. Just a few days ago, we couldn't even drive here. We filmed from a nearby hotel as police and gang members exchange fire. Armoured vehicles riddled with bullet marks now patrol the streets. This is why people have abandoned the downtown, and why they're fleeing in their tens of thousands, homes and businesses destroyed or taken by the gangs. Police officers try to direct the traffic away from the most dangerous areas, but it's still chaotic. The displaced, who are family in the provinces, pile their worldly goods onto buses. These people are heading south, but no routes out of Port-au-Prince are safe. Tickets out cost a fortune because the drivers have to bribe the gangs. 
Even then, there's no guarantee of safety from robbery or kidnapping. But staying isn't an option. Those who have nowhere to go and have lost their homes cram into schools and colleges. Children shelter under school desks. Education long since abandoned in these places. Gaunt and frail two elderly ladies ask us for food. They say they're starving, rubbing their stomachs. Food aid does get here, but there is never enough. There are simply too many to feed. Incredibly, there's six and a half thousand people living in this school, and this is by no means the only school that is absolutely rammed with people. Many of these families have moved multiple times. They were in refugee centres, the gangs came and moved them on multiple, multiple times. And they're all here because of the gang violence. Whole families are now camping. Most here have lost everything. They're basically stuck, their lives destroyed by the gangs. We're on the run. The gangs chased us out. This is our third camp. It's the third, third time you've had to move. Why do the gangs push you out of your home? We don't know. All we know is we are on the run. Our houses have been burnt down, and we're on the run. And we're not living. There's no life. We're in misery. We don't sleep. We're stressed. And we don't have enough to eat. With no government, no law and order, and civil society barely functioning, the people of Port-au-Prince are in the midst of a storm of insecurity. Society is falling apart, say those who are trying to help. Uh, you're very they're very traumatized because they're not used to living like this. There's no privacy for showering and other personal hygiene, little food, and they're like sardines on top of each other because there's no space. What should be a beautiful Caribbean country with a vibrant capital is stuck in a vortex of violence, poverty, lawlessness, and a leadership void. They're praying things get better but many here fear it could actually get worse. Well, the chaos gripping Haiti hasn't happened overnight. It has a long history of anarchy, but that has descended in recent months following the assassination of the country's president. To explain more about why the gangs have seized control now, here is our international affairs editor, Dominique Waghorn. Haiti is less a country, it was once said, more an international crime scene. It first grabbed global attention and infamy in the 50s with the blood-soaked rule of Francois de Vallier, known as Papa Doc. His paramilitary secret police, the Tonton Macoute, killed their victims in their thousands, cutting out their organs with machetes, while he stole a reported billion dollars worth of foreign aid, made voodoo the country's official religion and left it an economic disaster zone. His son, Baby Doc, was no better. Thousands murdered or tortured, hundreds of thousands fleeing, while he lived a lavish lifestyle. His wedding cost a reported $2 million. There were hopes for a while in the 90s of democracy being restored with the help of the Clinton administration during the presidency of the Catholic priest Jean-Bertrand Aristide. But those efforts failed. Then a series of natural disasters compounded Haiti's misfortunes. Tropical storms and hurricanes, then the devastating earthquake of 2010 that killed over 220,000 people, injured 300,000 and left 1.5 million homeless. Haiti has never recovered. More anarchy followed. In 2021, President Moise was assassinated, shot 12 times in the head and torso, his left eye gouged out and his arm and ankle broken. All this has left Haiti the poorest country in Latin America and the Western Hemisphere. Nearly 5 million people suffer acute hunger. 60% live on less than $4 a day. Almost half have no access to clean drinking water. And a third of the population have no access to electricity. The country relies massively on foreign aid, $13 billion of it, from the UN from 2010 to 2020. Tourism, once a huge source of income, has not surprisingly massively declined from 1.3 million tourists in 2018 to 150,000 in 2022 and even fewer now. In the chaos and crisis, Haiti has seen gangs taking over. Hired at first by politicians, then grabbing power for themselves. There are now thought to be more than 200 gangs in Haiti with waiting lists to join them. They have seized control of the customs service, public markets, water electricity networks and public transport, stealing millions from them. The crisis has led to a mass exodus of people on the move, both in 
and out of the country. 360,000 people are internally displaced. In just the last few weeks, 33,000 have fled the violence in the capital, heading for the south. The UN says more than 300,000 have fled overseas and 20% of Haiti's GDP is money sent home by Haitians living abroad. The poorest country in the West is in economic, social and political meltdown as it sinks deeper and deeper into violent crisis and is torn apart by warring gangster warlords. Dominic Waghorn there. Well, let's go straight back uh, to Stuart now. And Stuart, I guess the, the question is, what are the police doing uh, to, to fight back? Well, they do carry out raids. And we know in the last week or so, a couple of um, big name uh, gangsters have been killed. But I have to say, it's a sort of stalemate um, with the gangs. And right now, there's not much happening uh, at all. I think the problem for the police, uh, particularly in the last uh, couple of weeks or so, is that the gangs have coordinated their attacks. So this violence just flares up, and it can be anywhere in the city, but it was happening in multiple areas of the city. Basically, the police were completely uh, overstretched and couldn't really uh, cope at all. They were literally down to defending uh, their own position. So really, the gangs are so powerful, particularly in Port-au-Prince and all the areas, areas around uh, the capital, that there's really not much that the police uh, can do to go on the offensive, if you like. It's basically a matter of containing and controlling as best as they can. Well, uh, Stuart, let's see uh, your report on what the police are doing. And I, I should warn you, there are some distressing images from the start of Stuart's report, including people lying dead in the streets. Another day in Port-au-Prince, a lull in the fighting and the cars are back on the streets. Another day and another body on the side of the road. It's becoming normal here. This man was shot, his family covered him and left. Burials are expensive. Another street, two more bodies, a man and a woman shot as they rode a motorcycle. Nobody knows why any of these murders are happening. We see the dead every day. This city is burning and there seems to be no end, no solution, perhaps even no hope. Neighbourhood after neighbourhood is barricaded off. Some are gang territories, some are communities trying to protect themselves. Absolutely nowhere feels safe. Through the barricades, we were given permission to enter a place called Salino. This community of about 10,000 people has been attacked by two separate gangs for a year. They want to take it over. At least 80% of Port-au-Prince has fallen to the gangs, but not here. That's because Salino is protected by armed vigilantes and off-duty policemen who live here and fight together. Every day, this is a struggle to survive. They are surrounded. The armed defenders of Salino, the men who do the fighting, did not want to be identified. Guided by a policeman, we were taken to the various barricades that protect Salino. On the other side is gang territory. It really is that close. So one gang here, barbecue here, and another one here? Or? No, it's That's all barbecue. Barbecue, uh -huh. came here, Bella. Uh -huh. Bella, after Bella, there's Cache de Fe. Cache de Fe, and Iso, Village de Dieu. All gangs, all, all gangs. gangs. But not here. Not. This is police. The front lines are deserted. Nobody lives here now. It really is a battlefield. Homes burnt out by the gangs have been taken back, but they're uninhabitable. This place is a, in a constant battle with gangs who want to take control of it. If they do, if the vigilantes and the police fail to keep a hold of it, then pretty much the whole of Port-au-Prince will belong to the gangs. The atmosphere is really different to other places. It's quiet, but that's because obviously the vigilantes are here. We've just seen uh, police patrolling, but it is a constant gun battles here, and they're constantly having to keep guard of their property. Inside, the community looks pretty much like anywhere else in Port-au-Prince, but keeping it like this isn't easy. The regular attacks kill men on both sides. It's a turf war, and the vigilantes are holding on. They believe they will win, or rather, they hope they will. It's us citizens, along with the police officers, who are controlling this area. Without them, 
we wouldn't have what you see here in Salino, and we continue to fight tooth and nail, night and day, to protect the area. When the roads of Port-au-Prince go quiet, you know it's dangerous. This is the main road to the international airport. It's the only place guarded by the military, but it's completely closed. The overwhelming sense you get is of a capital city not only cut off from the rest of the country, but cut off from the rest of the world. It's a siege from within, and everyone is a prisoner. Well, the head of the United Nations Children's Agency, UNICEF, has said scenes in the region resembled something out of Mad Max. American officials say the situation is dire and have begun evacuating some nationals trapped in Haiti. But they're also deporting people back to the country. So are they helping or hindering the situation? I, I spoke to Vedant Patel, a spokesperson for the U.S. State Department. I just want to get your assessment of the deteriorating situation in Haiti. Thanks so much for having me. So uh, first and foremost, this is something that we have pushed uh, with the United States uh, quite regularly for a number of weeks now. Uh, we think it is so important that Haitian stakeholders come together and select the names of who they will have represent themselves on this transitional presidential council, which has a lot of important work at task picking an interim prime minister, uh, managing the deployment of this multinational security uh, force mission. Um, the security situation in Haiti is untenable, and that is why we it's so important that this uh, work quite uh, importantly move forward. And uh, we hope that uh, there's some credible progress on this presidential council soon. Do you um, and are you willing to work with any of the gang leaders uh, and, and the gangs uh, when it comes to any kind of transitional council and bringing them to the table to negotiate, given they do have control of about 80 percent of, of Port-au-Prince? The future of this country needs to be determined by uh, the Haitian people. Uh, but clearly, I think unequivocally, we can say that um, someone, people, individuals, um, partaking in violence, who uh, are uh, under arrest, who have a track record of doing unlawful things, um, should not necessarily be the ones leading this country. You say that, but it also does, as you say, need to be Haitian-led, and these gangs currently have, have control uh, over over the capital and, you know, are, are, are doing the kind of violent things that, that remains are unthinkable. However... Don't you think that perhaps there should be a way to talk to them so that they stop the violence as well? We cannot have uh, uh, unlawfulness and uh, the, the kind of chaos that we're seeing on the ground in Port-au-Prince right now. That is why it's so important that this multinational uh, security support mission gets up and running. Simultaneously, we're also dealing with the issues of the future governance of the country. And that's where the TPC is going to have the very important task of appointing a prime minister. Why is the United States deporting Haitians back to the country, given how violent the current situation is? Haitian migrants are being deported into a, a death trap. I mean, we're seeing bodies, uh, you know, all over the streets at the moment. So first, we absolutely need to address the crisis on the ground in Haiti. It is a dire, dire situation, and every day counts. Simultaneously, though, we're going to continue to be a country that enforces our immigration laws. So sending Haitians back is something that you think is OK and you will continue to do so? Look, uh, again, this is something that the Department of Homeland Security can speak to, but the deportation of individuals who have um, entered the United States unlawfully or who have been deemed um, that they don't have a risk of credible fear uh, to, to stay in the United States, that is consistent with our immigration policy, regardless of the country of origin. But it is important for um, Haiti to be able to stand on its own feet because, of course, the United Absolutely. States, um, Absolutely. United States is, is concerned about the influx of, of migrants that may turn up uh, to the United States as a result of uh, the fragility in the country. Of course, we're going to watch and assess the circumstances and uh, adjust our own planning to, to meet those situations. Um, so do you have an idea of when this transitional council will be installed? Our hope is very soon.
Vedant Patel, spokesperson for the US State Department. Uh, let's get a final thought now from Stuart. And Stuart, you spent years covering the chaos and, and the, the crises in, in Haiti. How does the current situation compare? Yeah, it's always a difficult place to work. And as you say, it has been chaotic for a very, very long time. But I would say that this is the worst that I can remember. You know, we, every day we go out, we see uh, bodies on the streets. Nobody knows why those people have been killed, but they're there uh, every day in really quite large numbers. And obviously the violence has been flaring and has been very, very uh, dangerous on the streets and still is uh, in Port-au-Prince. I think what's interesting about what we've seen is where a lot of people actually agree with what Barbecue says about the disparity of wealth here, about corruption, about poor. Uh, political leadership. The problem is that he's had the head of a, a gang consortium and some of those gangs are much more violent uh, than him and so people are raped and murdered and their houses uh, are burnt down and they're, they're displaced. So that's the real problem. But a lot of what he says about how the people of Haiti have to decide their own future with their own leadership does resonate here. It's just the sort of methodology of the gangs that's the problem. Yeah, Stuart, um, thank you so much for your uh, continued reporting from Haiti and for that extraordinary interview today. Haiti's future hangs in the balance, so will the international community come to the table and speak to the gang leaders to avoid more bloodshed? Thank you for watching this special program on the gangs of Haiti.